Good morning, and welcome to 2050, where you wake up in the morning by this wonderful, self-selected, gorgeous AI avatar who says, I've got 25 fabulous things for you to do today. 15 of them you should do just because they're cool. Around the world, you've got to connect them to new kinds of realities you've never experienced before. And 10 of them, eh, well, these are you know, smart contracts where you can actually make some money today doing what you want to do anyway. And if you approve, just click here, and we will have those smart contracts uh, executed, and the money will flow to your account. That is a very, very plausible surprise-free forecast, by the way. So the future of 2050 can be quite fabulous but we've got a couple of things to solve in the meantime. One is that we've got a world order that's basically based on the concept of zero-sum political power. If the United States increases its power, China says, uh-oh, that we're going to decrease our power. So, so this idea of zero-sum political geopower is going to lead continually to conflict. And if we continue with that paradigm, because no one wants to lose, right? And because of the new kinds of technology, small countries can influence big countries without a problem. So this is unending, very complex conflict if we stay this way. We can make a shift between here and 2050 into synergetic relations. We're doing several experiments at the moment, South Asia is one of them, where each country gets to figure out what is its synergistic relationship with another country. Imagine, what's the synergistic relationship between Pakistan and India? We can pull that one off. We've got definitely a good future in 2050. Next, we've got to govern the transition from narrow intelligence to general intelligence. Now, I understand that in a couple of sessions from now, there's going to be one on uh, artificial general intelligence. This is great. I want to listen to that. But right now, there's a lot of controversy about GPT chat and all the rest of that stuff. That's still narrow intelligence. If we don't get the general intelligence right, then how a super intelligence evolves from the general intelligence will be beyond our control and not necessarily to our liking. If you have any doubts, talk to the Neanderthals. We homo sapiens were more intelligent than Neanderthals and they lost out. More intelligent species tend not to treat less intelligent species well. We have a chance to set up the preconditions, the rules, guidelines, guardrails for general intelligence over the next few years. If we don't do that, eh, it may not work out well. Another one, big investments have got to come up. One is in pure meat. This may not sound very striking to you, but it's a gigantic issue for the future. We've got a lot of problems with water, land, uh, and protein and iron coming up with making the brains right in, in early ages. And early children need this iron and protein in early in stage, and meat is one of the best ways to do it. But if you take a look at the next, what, 1.8, 1.7 billion people between here and 2050, it won't add up. It doesn't work. We have to produce food differently if we're going to make it. And one, we know we can go from genetic material to pure meat directly. You don't cut out the middleman. Every businessman knows you cut out the middleman to make better profits. Same with meat. Uh, next, seawater agriculture. All the coastlines of the world can be turned into agriculture, except for the Riviera and nice you know, places like that. You don't worry about that. But the horrible places along the edges like uh, Somalia, it's got thousands of coastlines. It's just perfect for this. You, use, you cut in channels and you make irrigation based upon salt water. And that's where we can move a lot of our agriculture to. It also solves some of the freshwater problems, the argument between agriculture and the urban conflicts coming up. Another one is the AI avatar, which I just mentioned. Uh, another is brain building. We are going to go into a more complex future than in the past. How many geniuses do you need in the agricultural age? How many geniuses do you need in the industrial age? A little more, but not as many. Same information age. As we go to the conscious technology age where the consciousness and technology becomes a global continuum, you want to be as smart as possible. Well, we understand bodybuilding. All schools have gymnasiums and bodybuilding, right? But we've got to figure out how to do brain building. We know a lot about the, how the brain can be improved. Why can't we make improving intelligence as an objective of education? I give Venezuela credit. They had a couple of years where they had increasing intelligence as an objective of education, but it lasted just a few years. But so far, no ministry is doing this, and that's got to be done. The whole world can become more intelligent than it is right now. 
Synthetic biology is one of the big growth areas. Think of all the things nature can do that you can't do. Now imagine that you take pieces of genetic material from one species, another species, another species, put them together in an entirely new, 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 new relationship. This is a gigantic growth area coming up. AI leads to universal basic income and self-actualization economy. You hear the stories about how AI can get rid of jobs, and they're talking about some of that right now with the narrow intelligence. But the general is a just a much bigger impact coming down the road. So we've got to figure out how to anticipate that and get the arts industry, the television, movies, and so forth into the idea that you can become your own boss. You can create your own life. You couldn't do that in the agricultural age. You really couldn't do it in the industrial age either. But in the future, you can create, as I mentioned with your AI avatar before, your own, your own life, your own world. As a result, you then can have, with a basic income, you then have the freedom to begin to experiment, to explore. Who are you? Between birth and death, or maybe not death, but between birth and death, what do you want to be on this planet? Do you really want to fit in? Our whole education system and everything else is a sign for how you fit in. What the entrepreneurs here know, hey, you're not fitting in, you're creating something. That becomes a normal cultural thing if we make it right. Okay. Now, a lot of talk about strategy, futures, foresight, strategy, strategic, for all that sort of stuff. It gets confusing. Think of this future stuff as food and the strategy as the muscle. So, for example, I made the comment that if we continue with zero-sum geopolitics, we got serious problems, we got to go to synergy. Well, the description of the potential future, that's the future foresight stuff. The strategy is create the synergies. So these are two different things. They should, uh, and in business, you really got to make, make these distinctions. Listen to all these future stuff, but you take counsel yourself. Integrate that into your own strategy. So we've got a big, 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 big geopolitical argument coming up. In this ring, as I mentioned, all of human history has been zero sum. So can we really make a change to synergy? Businesses can also do this too, by the way. We teach in business schools competitive intelligence, competitive advantage, competitive strategy. What if you learned in parallel, what is my, what is synergetic intelligence for my business? What would that be? What would be my synergetic advantage of my business? And what synergetic strategies ought I to pursue? Consider that in parallel. Now, very quickly, you've got three kinds of artificial intelligence. The narrow we have today, the general intelligence that can act like an agent. See, the narrow intelligence is like a tool. You use the tool. It helps you along and so forth. But artificial general intelligence is more like you in the sense that it can act, it can do initiative stuff and, and, and be independent of, of, of large databases to build it. It can create its own algorithms, its own software. It can create go beyond. And then artificial superintelligence. The difference between super and general is that superintelligence is a general intelligence, except it has evolved to the point that it sets its own goals, its own strategies, its own purposes, completely independent of humans and without humans' ability to understand it. It's beyond us. In the same way that our strategies and our activities are way beyond what the cockroach can understand. Yes, it's almost that sort of difference. So what's happening, this is a great opportunity for business, what's happening is that the narrow intelligences will be used to automate society. It'll handle the plumbing, it'll handle the electricity, all of that, just like in your body, you have an autonomic nervous system, each one's narrow intelligence. Circulatory system, one purpose. Skeletal system, one purpose. They're all one purpose stuff. But that's what makes your body work so that your brain is free to be a general intelligence. So then make that analogy to society as well. So think about how your business fits into making the whole urban environment an integrated whole intelligence system because society is getting too complex, urban systems are getting too complex really to manage by one mayor. It's no offense against the mayor, I heard he opened up and did a good job, but it's not possible, it's too complex. So we've got to have turning that over to autonomic nervous system just like we did with our body and evolution. So, I want you to, this PowerPoint will be available for everybody if they want it, okay? So you don't have to remember all this detail. 
But think of your business, of the synergies among these different things, the artificial intelligence, the three kinds I mentioned, robotics, synthetic uh, biology and genomics, uh, computational science, uh, cloud and data analytics, uh, artificial augmented reality, nanotechnology, two kinds, by the way. Right now, we've got big machines making little things. We haven't gotten the next stage, which is the little things making big things. We haven't gotten that. When we get that, that's the big next industrial revolution, according to uh, Eric good friend. Uh, and quantum computing is making a lot of progress, by the way. Quantum computing may very well be here before artificial general intelligence. The two will be synergetic with each other. Telepresence, holographic communications, uh, intelligence augmentation, collective intelligence, bio, uh, blockchain, 3D, 4D printing, drones, driverless cars, other autonomous vehicles, conscious technology, and the synergies among these. So your homework assignment for the next time you do your long-term strategy is what are the synergies among these technologies that can have future implications for your business? That's one of the ways to ride the, ride the wave rather than have the wave knock you down. So futurists have told people in the past that as we move from the industrial age to the information age, there's going to be all this unemployment and, oh, my God, you're going to replace paper and all that stuff, and it didn't that really happen that way, right? So w why wouldn't this concern about artificial intelligence be wrong again? Maybe it'll create more jobs than it replaces. Well, a couple things to consider. One, the speed of change is much different today than it was in the transition from the industrial age to the information economy. Much different speed. Two, globalization, interactions, and synergies among these new technologies that I mentioned before. Your cell phone, who would have figured that a future of a camera would be a calendar? Or a future of a calendar would be a video camera, etc. Now all those things get integrated. So integration of these things is very new in the history of technology, or the amount of it. The existence of a global platform, the internet. I was involved in helping internet get connected in a bunch of countries with what's called X.25. I had to get in a jet plane and stay in a hotel, time and cost, with, because we didn't have the internet yet. When we have the internet now, with one click, you can transfer technology and information worldwide simultaneously. We didn't have that ability. There's no platform for making such change before. Standardization of databases, that sounds a little boring, but it means that our research cap capability and breakthroughs can go much, much faster because we can collaborate with many different countries, many different corporations simultaneously. Few plateaus or pauses or change to allow. The laptop I have looks a little similar to the laptop I had in 1992. Obviously, a lot of different guts in there. But I'm, I've adapted to how to use it, how to carry it, how to plug it in. I've had time to adjust. But if, take for example, GPT chat, then all of a sudden there's GPT-4. And you've got uh, Alpha Zero, Alpha Go, Alpha Zero, Alpha Mu. There's a new one coming up, Mu. Uh, these things can go so quickly you don't get a chance to adjust. Just when you figured you had an understanding of how to use chat GPT, you know, you got to figure out how to use chat GPT-4. Well, it's not just one stream. There's going to be stuff coming out of China. There's going to be stuff coming out of the United States, different countries. So all this change, you got, it's hard to have a chance to get used to things, which can cause disruptions, which can also lead to unemployment. Billions of empowered people in relatively democratic free markets able to initiate activities, which means that the rate of complexity continues, which means forecasting it is a little more difficult. It's easy to forecast when you've got a time as a circle and in the agricultural age, when to plant, when to reap. That's a simple operation. But when you've got all these people like yourselves creating the future, it's hard to figure out what all you're going to do. I've got to talk to all of you. It's hard to do. And last, machines can learn how you do and then or what you do and then do it better than you. That was not around before. So these seven things are why universal basic income in the future may be necessary. When I wrote some scenarios about this, I found out that no one had a cash flow projection, which means that no one understood financial sustainability of guaranteed incomes. Eventually we'll get there and we'll get that done, but in the meantime, it's not financially sustainable in my view doing the mathematics myself. 
By 2030, 2035, it might very well be. And I got to come. Okay. All right. And for those that are interested, all is in here. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerome Glenn. Thank you.